I'm Susan Yaffe with VOA's Middle East Monitor. Coming up, Army defectors reportedly attack a military base in Syria. Diplomatic tensions escalate as Turkey meets with the Syrian opposition. We have told this group that the fate of Syria will be determined by the Syrian people. Pentagon leaders defend the U.S. withdrawal from Iraq. And Egypt is dealing with how to proceed with elections. It's all ahead on The Voice of America. Syrian opposition activists say army defectors have attacked a military base near the capital, Damascus, in an apparent escalation of the uprising against the government of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Amateur video emerged today showing the violence in Syria, where activists say rebels of the Free Syrian Army fired rockets and machine guns at an Air Force intelligence complex in the Damascus suburb of Harasap. There was no independent confirmation of the rebel attack or information about casualties. For more on why the Air Force Intelligence Complex was targeted, VOA's Michael Lippin spoke with Chris Phillips, the deputy editor of the Economist Intelligence Unit's Middle East team in London. The Syrian regime have four main intelligence bureaus, all of which um, spy on one another as well as on their citizens. And the Air Force Intelligence is uh, notorious as one of the most um, vicious and also one that focuses um, particularly on preventing dissent within the army itself, within the armed forces. And many believe that the Air Force Intelligence uh, perhaps is preventing uh, people from defecting from the army, and perhaps people believe that by targeting this symbolic base, uh, it will facilitate uh, more people defecting uh, to the Free Syrian Army. Although I would add, I think this is primarily a symbolic gesture rather than an active attempt to take out Air Force intelligence. The Air Force intelligence is an enormous organization within Syria. I'm also curious to know why, why you think the rebels have not really done anything in Damascus up to now, because I think most of the fighting between the rebels and, and the military has been concentrated in other parts of Syria, yeah. like Idlib and, and, and Homs and Dara. So. Well, I think it's interesting that they've um, targeted D Damascus now. I think certainly they have been emboldened by um, the moves by the Arab League, by um, King Abdullah of Jordan's recent um, suggestion that uh, Bashar al-Assad should stand down. And, of course, uh, the, the, the general uh, increase in international isolation that the Syrian regime is feeling. The rebels are aware that in order for the regime to, to be toppled, Damascus needs to fall, as does the, 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 the second city of Aleppo, both of which have been relatively quiet. Uh, I believe that by attacking uh, the outskirts of Damascus, they're trying to send a message to the for want of a better word, the undecided people in Damascus to let them know that, you know, this is going to start affecting their lives as well. And now is the time to join the uprising to, to sort of play their cards as such. I think I, I should add that when we talk about the rebels and the Free Syria Army, whilst they call themselves a single group, actually, you're talking about a lot of different pockets of people rather than a clear structured united command and actually in many ways we're getting slightly mixed messages from the free syria army in in the last few days they have said that they are um they will fight uh, under the guidance of the syrian national council the sort of the umbrella rebel organization or um, opposition organization that is based out of turkey um, and they've also said that they're going to stop attack attacking the military and instead focus on defending protesters instead however what we see this morning is a clear deliberate attack on military uh, installation and what i imagine is actually you're getting uh, different groups wanting to do different things with slightly different um, agendas in different parts of the country so whilst i think all the groups involved in this are united in a common purpose and wanting to topple the regime the specific tactics do seem to be varying from group to group at the moment do you see this leading uh, toward a, a more general escalation of of the uprising into some kind of libya style revolt i think it certainly has the potential to but at the moment we're not there and the two big distinctions between what happened in libya and what's happened in syria are firstly you haven't seen whole units defecting from the syrian army to join the rebels as you did in libya the other big difference with libya is that the syrian rebels don't have any free liberated parts of syria 
in Libya, they had Benghazi as a starting point from which to, to launch further attacks. There is no such sort of liberated area which the international community uh, can lend logistical and financial support to in Syria uh, for the rebels as yet. Chris Phillips, the deputy editor of the Economist Intelligence Unit's Middle East team in London. Syria's third largest city of homes has paid a heavy price as one of the centers of the country's eight-month-old uprising. Rights activists say Syrian security forces have killed more than 1,100 civilians in the city and its surrounding province since the uprising began more than any other part of the country. Experts say the unrest has escalated in homes because of the region's poverty, its role as a natural home for army defectors, and its history of anti-government protests. Holmes also has a history of opposition to Syria's ruling Ba'ath Party that goes back to the 1960s, when Ba'athists took power in a coup. Business owners and religious conservatives in Holmes organized protests in 1964 against the Ba'ath Party's socialist and secular agenda. But Syria's Ba'ath-led government ordered security forces to suppress the uprising, keeping the city quiet for decades. Stephen Hedeman, a senior advisor for the Middle East Initiatives at the U.S. Institute of Peace, says resentment of Ba'ath rule in homes persists. What we're seeing in some respect is the revival of an ethos of protest and resistance to the Ba'ath government that anyone familiar with Homs would recognize from its past, but which is really taking very new forms and reflects very contemporary grievances. Among the new grievances fueling this year's uprising in Homs are poverty and government corruption, says Masab Azawi of the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, an opposition group. The Britain-based activist says anti-government sentiment is strong in the city's Baba Amur district, which has seen months of peaceful street protests against the 11-year rule of President Bashar al-Assad. Baba Amr, as, as the oldest and poorest part of Homs, was severely affected. The people there are very poor and very vulnerable, and they feel that this regime put them so badly below the age of poverty. So they are the real power which making or moving the acts of uprising in Homs. Homs and the surrounding province also have become a hub for thousands of army deserters who have refused orders to attack the protesters. Rights activists say Homs is a natural refuge for the defectors because many of them are from the province, the nation's largest. Syria's government blames the violence in Homs and other protest hubs on troublemakers. It says religious extremists from the Sunni majority are terrorizing minority Alawites and Christians and attacking security forces. Homs is about 40 percent Sunni, 30 percent Alawite, and 30 percent Christian. Syria's Alawite-dominated leadership says it is trying to protect minorities by cracking down on the extremists. The Heidemann says there is little evidence of Sunni protesters in Homs pursuing an extremist ideology or organizing sectarian attacks. Heidemann sees the Syrian government as exaggerating an Islamist threat to try to divide and weaken the opposition movement. Exiled Syrian dissidents say the government also is trying to incite sectarian violence in homes by recruiting Alawite mercenaries. Osama Manajed, a London-based member of Syria's main opposition coalition, the Syrian National Council, says community leaders have formed committees to counter the violence. When the notable people from both sides discussed the issue, they realized that neither Sunnis did this, nor the Alawites nor the Christians. Opposition activists in homes are counting on an important ally, military defectors who formed the Free Syrian Army to defend civilians. The Free Syrian Army has fought increasingly deadly battles with pro-Assad troops in and around homes in recent weeks. Dissidents say the defectors also have formed protective lines around protests and urged demonstrators to remain peaceful. Heidemann says army defectors and protest leaders are not yet united. There tend to be divisions between them about which tactics are most effective in the long run. And there are peaceful protesters who are actually uh, quite disturbed by the increasing use of force by groups opposed to the government. Stephen Heidemann, a senior advisor for Middle East initiatives at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Turkey's prime minister says he no longer has confidence in the Syrian government. 
His comments follow the attacks Saturday by pro-government demonstrators on Turkish diplomatic missions in Syria. Tensions between the two former close allies continue to escalate as Ankara increases its support for the Syrian opposition. Dorian Jones has details from Istanbul. Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan, in a speech to its parliamentary deputies Tuesday, said his country had lost confidence in the Syrian leadership and launched an attack against President Bashar al-Assad. Bashar, sen Türk Addressing Mr. Assad disrespectfully by his first name, Bashar, Mr. Erdogan said a future cannot be built on the blood of oppressed people and that the Syrian leader will pay the price sooner or later. Mr. Erdogan said history will remember such leaders as those feeding on blood and that Mr. Assad was well on the way to opening that page. Bilateral tensions increased after pro-Assad supporters attacked diplomatic missions across Syria on Saturday. Ankara is demanding a full apology and the prosecution of those responsible for the attacks. Following the attacks, Turkish Foreign Minister Ahmed Davutoglu on Sunday formally met with representatives of the opposition Syrian National Council. Turkish Foreign Ministry spokesman Selçuk Unal said Ankara had agreed to the opposition's request to open an official office. They don't have an office in Turkey. The Turkish Foreign Minister, Mr. Davutoglu, received Syrian Council members yesterday for a second time. Uh, in that meeting, they have uh, explained uh, their views on the situation in Syria, and we have told this group that the fate of Syria will be determined by the Syrian people. It's up to them how to proceed, and we also suggested them to uh, stay in peaceful method in their uh, work. Ankara has in the past few months allowed the Syrian opposition to operate in Turkey. Last month, various opposition groups formed the Syrian National Council at a meeting in Istanbul. Diplomatic correspondent Simi Ediz for the Turkish newspaper Milliet. It's playing an interesting uh, bittersweet game there. I mean, it's saying that it is not arming the opposition in any way, but it is clear that on the other hand, it is providing them protection. Uh, and a venue to meet. And now that Foreign Minister Davutoglu has physically actually sat down and met, received the opposition, I think that Turkey is in the final analysis uh, in pursuing these uh, contacts with the opposition. I think in the final analysis, it considers that Assad's time is over and that it's just a matter of time now. While Ankara says it only supports peaceful opposition, it's hosting the leaders and members of an opposition militia, the self-declared Syrian Free Army. The group claims to have as many as 15,000 members fighting the Syrian army. Rumours are growing both in Turkey and the wider region that Ankara could intervene militarily and create a safe haven in Syria for opponents of the Assad government. Turkish Foreign Ministry spokesman Unal, when asked, would not rule out such a possibility but said it's not on the agenda now. Well, like every country, Turkey and the Turkish government has also its contingency plans for everything, for every eventuality, on every occasion and on every issue. Mr Erdogan had indicated that sanctions would be announced last month, but the October earthquake in the Turkish city of Van saw Ankara distracted. Now Syria is back on the top of the agenda. But diplomatic columnist it is says with its 800-kilometer border with Syria and the rapidly deteriorating situation there, Ankara is becoming increasingly careful in its actions towards Damascus. So I think Turkey is very much reacting to a developing situation uh, about which it has no definite uh, knowledge as to how it will end. Uh, and therefore, I think Turkey feels it has to be very cautious here. Turkey's increasing ties with the Syrian opposition and international pressure against Damascus are seen as signs that Ankara believes the end game for President Assad has started. But observers say how that game will play out and what role Ankara will play still remains unclear. Dorian Jones of VOA News, Istanbul, Turkey. A senior Saudi prince says it is inevitable that Syrian President Bashar al-Assad will step down because he has not responded to calls to halt the violence against protesters. BOA correspondent Meredith Buell has details of the remarks by Prince Torki al-Faisal made during remarks in Washington.
Speaking to reporters, Prince Turki says the Syrian president has not responded to numerous efforts to end the deadly crackdown by government security forces on his political opposition. With the growing popular opposition to him and the killing every day, I think it's inevitable that, that he will have to step down. Turki spoke a day after Jordan's King Abdullah became the first Arab leader to publicly urge Syrian President Bashar al-Assad to leave office. Turkey, a former chief of the Saudi intelligence service, also said there is ample and heinous evidence that members of the Iranian government were involved in an assassination plot against the current Saudi ambassador to the U.S. The web of connections that were uncovered between the would-be assassins, elements of the Iranian government, especially senior members of the Quds Brigade and Mexican drug cartels, indicates the depths of depravity and unreason to which the Ahmadinejad regime has sunk. U.S. officials have accused two suspects of conspiring to carry out a $1.5 million plot by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard's elite Quds force to kill Saudi envoy Adel al-Jubair by bombing a Washington restaurant. Iran has denied involvement in the case. Turkey urged Iran to prosecute any of its citizens who played a role in the alleged plot. If there are any names mentioned of Iranian officials uh, in that case accused of, of plotting against the Saudi ambassador, then those officials should be brought to justice uh, in Iran. Turkey, a former Saudi ambassador to the U.S., said he was speaking as a private citizen. Meredith Buell, VOA News, Washington. invite you to join in with your views at our online poll embedded in the Bahrain story on our new website. Just visit VOA Middle East Voices, open the Bahrain story, and click to vote. That's at our social journalism site, VOA Middle East Voices. Egypt will start voting on a new democratic government starting November 28th. The generals in charge of Egypt, since Hosni Mubarak was run out of office in February, have recently issued some proclamations about the procedures for this election. Everyone from the Islamists to the secular Is and the youth movement that first took the Tahrir Square on January 25th are upset about it. The Muslim Brotherhood and some of their conservative Islamic parties threatened to fill Tahrir Square with protesters once again on Friday. Reporter David Arnold has been following these events in Egypt and is here in the studio with me. Uh, welcome, David. Thanks, Sue. So, uh, tell us what the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces has been doing. Well, they would like to do a lot, and what they've done recently is they have uh, proclaimed some super-constitutional principles. Uh, these principles go in several directions. One is they're trying to sequester their very large budget now and in the future from the prying eyes of the democratic process. Another of their efforts is to give them a chance to fill some of the 100 seats of a constitutional commission, which could reflect some of the people from the Mubarak era. A third thing is that they are saying that this whole process is going to delay the election of a president until somewhere around the beginning of 2013. The Supreme Council stands quietly behind their website, where many of these issues are announced. The generals remain an enigma. The editor of the Middle East Journal is Michael Dunn, and he has his own view of the efforts of these generals. No one's really quite sure uh, what is going on here because, uh, for example, at one point a week or so ago, the Army issued a new set of rulings or a new set of proposals through the uh, Deputy Prime Minister, which would have uh, kept the military budget out of Parliament altogether. The military budget would have been secret and would have been uh, purely the uh, the purview of the army. They backed off of that a little bit, or at least maybe they backed off it. They said this was not a non-negotiable demand or anything. They have uh, not shown a very good um, political sense. They've They've been rather secretive. They issue most of their declarations through a Facebook page. They only occasionally speak in public. Field Marshal Tantawi, though he's been speaking in public more lately, hardly appeared at all for the first six months after the fall of Mubarak. So really it's, it's a situation where we're seeing um, them kind of feeling their way, I think. They feel awkward. They've always 
they've always been kept out of politics. The Army stays out of politics. The Army gets to control its own sector of the economy and gets to prosper. And they want to protect those privileges on the one hand, but they haven't had much experience at actually playing politics, and they're not very good at it, seemingly. Whether the generals know what they're doing or not, they are in charge of the election of a people's assembly and the selection of those who will write a new constitution and write the ground rules for choosing the next president of the largest Arab population and a major player in the future of democracy in the Middle East. That's important. Well, thank you, David. Thank you, Sue. That's reporter David Arnold here in our Washington studios. A bomb exploded at a hotel used by U.N. staffers in southern Lebanon early today, causing extensive damage but no casualties. The explosion at the Queen Alyssa Hotel in the port city of Tyre shattered glass and hurled debris into the street, damaging cars, including two that belonged to the UNIFIL force deployed to keep peace near the frontier with Israel. Pentagon leaders are defending the Obama administration's decision to pull U.S. troops from Iraq by the end of the year despite questions about continuing violence in the country and the threat of Iranian intervention. VOA Pentagon correspondent Luis Ramirez reports. President Obama last month announced that all troops will be out by December 31st. The decision came after Washington failed to reach an agreement with the Iraqi government on granting legal immunity to any U.S. troops who were to remain in the country. On Tuesday, U.S. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta and the top U.S. military officer, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Martin Dempsey, went to Capitol Hill to defend that decision before members of the Senate Armed Services Committee. They faced tough questions from Republican Senator John McCain, who criticized the administration's failure to reach an agreement with the Iraqis. Panetta said the administration had no choice but to fulfill a 2008 U.S. agreement to withdraw the troops by the end of 2011. He said he believes Iraq is now an independent and sovereign country that can govern itself, and he hopes its leaders will make the right decisions for their people. For our part, the United States is ready to mark the beginning of a new phase in our relationship with Iraq, one that is normal, similar to others in the region, and based on mutual interests and mutual respect. More than 4,400 Americans have been killed since the U.S. invaded Iraq in 2003, and the war has cost Americans hundreds of billions of dollars. General Dempsey said the U.S. will not disengage completely. We have shed blood and invested America's treasure in Iraq. Our futures are inextricably linked. It's not a question of whether we'll continue to invest in Iraq. It's a question of how. There's no question we must continue to support the development of the Iraqi security force. Panetta and Dempsey said U.S. forces will continue to provide some counterterrorism training to Iraqi security forces at various camps in Iraq after December, while much of the responsibility for securing the 16,000 personnel attached to the U.S. Embassy would go to contractors. The withdrawal is happening despite concerns of some U.S. commanders and opposition U.S. lawmakers who point to continuing sectarian violence, worries about Iran's support of Iraqi insurgents, and the possible expansion of Iranian influence in the country. In his opening remarks Tuesday, General Dempsey indicated he shares concerns about Iraq's stability. In anticipation of the question about whether I'm concerned about the future of Iraq, the answer is yes. U.S. officials had hoped to leave a force of several thousand U.S. troops in place. Currently, 24,000 are still there, with the majority of them now in the process of leaving. Luis Ramirez, VOA News, at the Pentagon. This has been VOA's Middle East Monitor. Join us Monday through Friday for news from the region and of interest to the region. Coming up on International Edition, the price of gold is still holding. Thanks for tuning in to The Voice of America. For more on the stories you've heard on our radio programs, visit our website at voanews.com. 
That's where you'll find in-depth reports, related stories, videos, and more from our team of correspondents. Or take the news with you by downloading podcasts of your favorite VOA program. That's at voanews.com. VOA Online news for a changing world.